<clears throat> well, this Lenten season, the six weeks leading up to today, we've been studying how Jesus is our shalom. Shalom is a Hebrew word that has a multifaceted meaning. Peace, wholeness, harmony, prosperity, welfare, integrity, completeness, and the way God intended things to be. And when Jesus rose from the dead on Easter morn, the multifaceted fullness of this word was made manifest in our relationship with God and with one another. Through Jesus, there is now peace and wholeness, harmony, completeness that's possible in our relationship with our Creator and our relationship with one another. This promise of shalom goes all the way back to Jesus' birth at Christmas when we celebrated the angels proclaiming to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, shalom, to those on whom his favor rests. How did God our Creator accomplish this shalom through Jesus? Well, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 to look at how this happened. Paul writes, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. As for you, <clears throat> You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. <clears throat> At the beginning of this passage, we see a hope that is called for. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. The hope to which he has called you and me. What hope? That the very same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead, the very story we heard Jane read earlier, don't miss this. God uses that same power to transform you and me. There's a song by Lauren Daigle that talks about how this power is still at work, called Still Rolling Stones. Let's listen.
This song tells the story of that second power that we spoke of, of someone who's in effect dead, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking, six feet under, who then experiences something. Whatever that something is, at its essence, is the sense of this power. And then a voice saying, rise up. And then, all at once, I came alive, this beating heart, these open eyes, the grave let go. The darkness should have known. You're still rolling stones. First, I want to say Jesus experienced the exact same thing the song describes happening to you or me. He was bound for the gallows. Jesus is a dead man walking. He's caught up in the machinations of some of the most powerful forces on the planet. A world power and the religious elite. At the hands of common men, he's tortured and he's killed. Jesus is done for. All hope is lost. He dies a criminal's death. And these powerful forces are not surprised at all that it appears that they've won once again. I mean, don't they always win? Jesus is dead. He's lying in a tomb. The next scene in Scripture is the women coming to the tomb, but something happened between these two events. We heard the angel say, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. What must it have been like for Jesus in that moment when he rises? As we heard in the song, all at once I came alive. This beating heart, these open eyes, the grave let go. What must it have been like? In that most miraculous of moments, God is reconstituting Jesus' physical body. But more... This is the very first creative act of God in a new creation. Revelation 21 speaks of a new heaven and a new earth that will be created after the old heaven and the old earth have passed. And in this new vision, once again, heaven and earth touch like they did in the Garden of Eden. And God is with us and we are his people. And God walks with us and is present with us. That new heaven and that new earth is the ultimate hope for Christians. And Jesus' resurrected body is the very first creation in that new heaven and earth. That's why Jesus' body is different. They recognize him, but they don't recognize him. You'll remember, he can walk through walls. He can do things that our bodies can't do. He is a new creation. 
It's an amazing story. Jesus was dead, and then his newly created heart begins beating. Life. He becomes conscious that his eyes, which once again can see, are closed. He opens them. He tests out his resurrected arms and legs. He sits up. He looks around. And in that moment, that very moment, death is dead. Its power is lost. In that moment, death to life occurred. That power is the same power as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Do you see it? This very same power that God exerted to raise Jesus, that same power is used by God to make us alive even while we are dead in our sins. That is a force to be reckoned with. When the Father says to Jesus, rise up, not only does God exert that power in Jesus' resurrection to conquer creation's greatest enemy, death, God then goes further. He exerts that very same power to set us free from another kind of death. Every kind of bondage and sin in our lives that steal the life and the freedom in which God intended us to live. The song proclaims she was dead in her living. She was a dead man walking. And then in the song it says, I thought I was too far gone for everything that I've done wrong. Yeah, I'm the one who dug this grave, but you called my name. Then the voice of a Savior, she says, says, rise up. And all at once, I came alive, this beating heart, these open eyes, the grave let go, and darkness should have known that God is still rolling stones. God is still rolling stones. He's still bringing the dead to life. And here's the thing. He does it all as sheer gift by grace. Paul writes, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. That's the moment that his power was exerted over you and me when we surrender to Christ. We are made alive in Christ even when we're dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. What the Easter story, this amazing story of the creator of the cosmos becoming one of us, what that story tells us is that we've never gone too far. Our sin is never beyond the reach of God's grace. So whatever shame or brokenness or sin you brought in here with you today, because of God's great love for you because he is rich in mercy because his his grace in Jesus Christ he will make you alive with Christ even while you're still in bondage why does this matter why does it matter do we really need the grace of God because our culture ties our worth our sense of purpose and identity not to the grace-filled love of God, but to the very opposite. David Zoll puts it this way. Performancism is the assumption, usually unspoken, that there is no distinction between what we do and who we are. Your resume isn't part of your identity. It is your identity. What makes you lovable, indeed what makes your life worth living, is your performance at X, Y, or Z. Just like the weight scale or the calendar, it knows no mercy. We all live under that pressure in our culture. We feel it every day. And if that's where you're trying to find your purpose, your identity, your worth, 
I don't know if you figured it out yet, but it's a losing battle. This is not freedom. This is not life. This is existence. This is bondage. Because with this set of rules, we can never be enough. And intuitively, we know it. This is the good news of the gospel of grace. This is why Jesus came, because in a world that's always been a performancism world, a world that has always set the bar at perfectionism, where none of us can find fulfillment, none of us can find solace or purpose or meaning, we will always, always be left wanting. And into that world comes the gift of grace. Unconditional love, forgiveness, mercy, shalom. God giving to us, in us, the things as they were intended to be. Our integrity, our wholeness, our completeness, our being exactly who we were made to be. Our being set free. And as we discover freedom in a performancism world, God uses our free lives to show the riches of his grace to others. That we might discover God's grace and love in Jesus Christ. And that they might discover God's grace and love in Jesus Christ. I mean, I don't know if you think about it, but what's driving our world, this performancism, this grasping for power and prestige and the ability to hold that out over others as the basis for our identity and our existence, it is the very root cause of all the things we hate about our world. The division that we live in today, the things that we feel, the fear that lives inside of us of judgment from others because we see it writ large everywhere. All of that is because of the brokenness inside of us. It's because of us trying to prove our worth, trying to find an identity that's real, that makes us feel better about ourselves, but it leads to brokenness and division. And so God's kingdom is all about you and me discovering, rediscovering God's grace, that it is sheer gift that God gives this to us. And that as we receive it, God wants our lives to demonstrate to the world God's incomparable love and grace to them, that they might discover the freedom of being loved at the very core of who they are unconditionally by their creator through the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as more and more people don't just have a set of doctrine that they believe in, but they have a relationship, an intimate and organic relationship with the living God, as that happens, the world is transformed. That is the hope of Easter morning. That is the hope of the gospel that God gives us. That's what makes what happened on this day 2,000 plus years ago a force to be reckoned with. God exerted his power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, and from that moment on, our greatest enemy, death, is dead. We no longer have to fear our dying, and by his sheer grace, he's still rolling stones. Not just the stone that covered Jesus' tomb, but yours and mine. He exerted that same power over us even while we were dead in our sin. We too were brought from a form of death and sin to life. And that power brings us freedom and purpose and identity found where it was originally intended to be found, which is in God, our Creator's unconditional love. For it is by grace that you have been saved, not by works, through faith. This is not from yourselves. This is not performancism. It is the gift of God, a force to be reckoned with. He is risen. <laughs>